Wendy's two for six dollars lets you mix and match some of our best items, like <gasps> Dave single with a ten piece crispy nugs, medium strawberry lemonade with a spicy chicken sandwich, spicy chicken with a Dave single, Dave single with a strawberry lemonade, strawberry lemonade, strawberry lemonade. If you're into that, chicken Sam crispy nugs, crispy nugs, strawberry lemonade, Dave's Dave's nugs, nugs, Sam Sam. Whew. Pick what you want at a price you want. <clears throat> Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's two for six. For a limited time, price and participation may vary at U.S. Wendy's. On the card only, single item at regular price. This week at Macy's, find your new favorite jeans with 40% off Levi's looks for him and her just in time for spring. Or use your coupon or Macy's card and take an extra 15% off handbags and wallets already 40 to 50% off. And take an extra 10% off great furniture and mattress deals too. Plus, Star Rewards members earn rewards even faster during Macy's Star Money bonus days. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of the Yard. Hope you're celebrating Maroon Friday today. It is also the first day of college baseball season. We are a baseball school. Some people struggle to admit that. They don't like it. They say, Steve, you know, I don't get it. Bottom line is we are a baseball school. We're a baseball crazy fan base that has set every on-campus attendance record there is. That's not by accident. It's not to say that we don't love everything else. We do. We've had a lot of success in college baseball over the years. The program began in 1885. We were the very first college baseball program in the state of Mississippi. And we remain supreme. Shall our reign live forever? We'll be taking on Virginia Military Institute today. Share with you guys on Wednesday show that uh, that's an experienced team. It didn't have much success last year. So we'll see how it goes. But I, I expect that we'll see um, a lot of pitching for both teams this weekend. You know, since we've been together, it was announced Cade Smith is the Friday starter for Mississippi State. Casey Hunt will go on Saturday and transfer from Memphis. Landon Gartman. We'll go on Sunday. So you've got some experienced guys. That's not to say that this is going to be the rotation the rest of the year. You people forget in 2021, we didn't have Sarantola. We didn't have Will Bednar on opening weekend. We went out there and played in the Globe Life Tournament. And then by the time we got to LSU, after LSU, Sarantola didn't throw a meaningful pitch the rest of the year. So a lot can change. My hope is this is the rotation the entire year because they go out and they prove to be effective. Wouldn't that be great? Because the, the season kind of hangs in the balance on the quality of pitching that we're going to get. You know, talking to some people around the program, we feel like the back end of the bullpen is going to be really strong. We just got to find a way to cover these, these first six innings. And that sounds easier said than done. If we can have a lead after six, we feel pretty confident in our ability to close things out. And so my hope is this weekend we have no uh, undue anxiety. We just go out there and take care of business, and we can get a lot of work for a lot of people. It's going to be cold. It's going to be chilly. Let me give you a little bit of a forecast here today. So today it's supposed to be in the 40s, dipping into the 30s in the late night hours. Tomorrow, a low of 27, that's in the morning hours, but a high around 56. Of course, that is a 2 p.m. 2 p.m. first pitch. And on Sunday, a little bit better. Low of 36, a high of 66. No rain in the forecast either of the three days. We do get some rain in the midweek. Uh, temperatures expected to warm up as we kind of get into next week. Matter of fact, we'll see some, uh, some highs in the 80s Wednesday and Thursday. And a chance of rain uh, next Sunday as Arizona State comes in. But, uh, again, we've got some time to, to work with all that. And you guys know the 10-day forecast, kind of the bane of the uh, existence these days because it always changes. You never know by the time we get to next Sunday, a lot could change. But uh, highs in the 70s next weekend. So it'll be, be cool but not cold. But uh, you better bring uh, some layers this weekend. Excited to get back out to Duke Noble Field. And a lot of it's because of all the frustration, right? The frustration that we've had. It's been so long since we played a baseball game. We had to sit there and watch the SEC tournament, knowing we didn't have a rooting interest. We're just kind of rooting against Tennessee. We watched the NCAA tournament. 
And then we go on to see our arch rivals win the NAFL championship a year after we did. Like many of you, I'm thinking, you know, at some point it was a matter of time before they got one. I'm glad we got one before they did because their commitment to baseball, again, is very good. But uh, it's a new year, and it's a new season. And we're going to talk a little bit more about SEC baseball later in the show. A lot of basketball content to get uh, to the midweek. Not good for Mississippi State. Not good. We had all this uh, exuberance. It's somewhat subdued. I mean, we're still okay, and we still got some room to work, but uh, we did not do ourselves any favor in the midweek here. So we'll talk about that uh, here in the next couple segments of the show. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. When you're, if you're making it to Starkville this weekend, it, make it a, an appointment to go by Bulldog Burger Company, whether it be for a meal or, or an adult beverage, happy hour, of course, every day from 3 to 6. We'll have some uh, takeover tap nights coming up too, kind of teasing those now as we get more details and information be happy to share those with you. But um, three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas. You can go out there and uh, and dine outside and have the heat of the nice chiminea out there. Lake Harbor Drive in a rich and flowed area. And, of course, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. Be sure and go check them out every time you're in town. It's worth it. Get the spring rolls as your appetizer. Make the world a more beautiful place. Makes you and everybody around you better looking. Right? And get those great restaurant-quality burgers, man. You can't beat them. No better place to get a hamburger in this, this, this part of the country, to be quite honest with you. Let's just kind of call it for what it is. They're called Bulldog Burger Company for a reason. They specialize in hamburgers, but they're not limited to hamburgers. I love that BLT grilled salad. Matter of fact, when I'm in the mood for a salad, that's where I go because the portions are so substantial. The ingredients are so fresh. I just simply can't do better for my money. You get a great meal at a great price with great service and a great atmosphere. Bulldog Burger Company, every time you go, you do. It's becoming an institution. Again, it is must-eat cuisine every time that you're in town. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right, we'll start with men's basketball. Yeah, Wallace walked. Okay, let's just go ahead and get that established. That said, it shouldn't have come down to that. It didn't. We kind of got some things off kilter. We knew it was going to be tough to beat Kentucky and beat the refs. And, you know, I, I tweeted this out. I don't understand why John Calipari has to get an explanation from Pat Adams after every single call. And, again, I, I get part of that is coaching theater. It's a chance for his team to kind of talk and, and settle in. But I also don't understand why Pat Adams is inclined to go over and talk to him every single time. What, what are we afraid of? Just call the ball game. We don't have to sit there and entertain the opposing coach. 71-68 is your final Mississippi State. Down by one at the break because Cam Matthews rammed home a three off the glass, kind of reminiscent of that Mario Austin three, just not quite as dramatic. But uh, we didn't manage that two-for-one real well right before the half. We didn't get a good shot. We give up a three as the shot clock's winding down. We do go up and get the three and and, uh, makes it a one-point game at the break. And then we're outscored by two in the second half. But the reality of it is is we had every opportunity to win this ball game. I think Kentucky and Mississippi State are pretty much even. The rankings reflect that. The records reflect that. The standings in the SEC don't. Both teams now 17 and 9. The Wildcats 8 and 5 in the league. Bulldogs 5 and 8. We got a little margin for error on the men's side, and we felt like this may be this and AM game probably the two most difficult games. So it's not a big surprise that we lost. It is a disappointment, to say the least. Let's take a quick look back at some uh, some key moments there in the second half. Because there was one stretch there, and I'll be honest with you. I said, hey, we're done. We're done. We're done. We get offensive rebounding. That was a big, big advantage for Kentucky. They did a great job on the offensive glass. Uh, Oscar Tashibwe, of course, uh, lived up to his potential. But with about eight minutes to go, it is a 13-point Kentucky lead. And I, I said, well, this is it. It's a ball game. We're done. We're done. But once again, the Mississippi State men proved their mettle. It's like, nah, we're not done. We're not going to quit. We're not going to quit. And all of a sudden, you look up at the five-minute mark after Deshaun Davis layup. It's a four-point game. To Kentucky's credit, they go right back and answer, push it back to six. Deshaun Davis then knocks down the three. It makes it a three-point game, and the hump is alive. And I thought Kentucky did a good job kind of managing the crowd a little bit. 
And maybe that's a bit of an indictment on our fans. Maybe we should not allow our exuberance and support to be somewhat influenced by the flow of the game. I know what happens sometimes we get caught up watching the game and not being a participant. But it seemed like they did a good job quieting the crowd. Maybe let's remain engaged. I know it's human nature. It requires a big commitment. And I give everybody a lot of credit. It was a sellout crowd. And uh, appreciate everybody showing up and making the hump an amazing environment. But Oscar, with a uh, layup here, pushes it back out to five. We make one of two free throws. And, again, this is the the, the Sean Davis rally here. But now it's a four-point game. And, uh, you know, State kind of flirted with that margin kind of the rest of the way. And then, finally, under a minute to play, Shaquille Moore hits a jumper to make it a two-point game. And you just got to find a way here, right? You got to find a way to get a stop. You know, they missed a three-pointer. And then we don't get a rebound. Chris Livingston runs it down on the inline. Cam Matthews has to foul. He makes one of two free throws, which gives us some time. Excuse me, he made both. Looking at my numbers wrong here. Well, then they foul us, right? So Eric Reed Jr., who had a huge three-fourths in the ball game, makes it a two-point game. Uh, Oscar misses a free throw. And then makes another. So it's a three-point game with you know, just seconds to play. And they like to foul for some reason. I, I don't quite understand it, um, especially considering the placement on the floor. And I, I get it. You know, when you're up three and you have, you know, you put them on the line. But, you know, what's the odds of uh, Cameron Matthews making, you know, three-pointer under those circumstances? I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't have done it. I'd, I would have just let it play out. However, they foul us, and Cam makes the first one, and you need to miss the second one. And Cam said in post game that was what he intended to do. He wanted to throw it off the back iron. Instead, we make it, and it really kind of removes all possibility of the comeback here because if we're down one and we get a rebound and maybe get a tap in situation, you win the game. But we made the free throw, which didn't help us at all. So that sets up basically the same situation, but the clock's our enemy here. We have to foul, and then Oscar makes them both, which makes it a three-point game. We have a chance for a desperation shot here. We make the long pass, get it to Shaquille Moore, but he loses the handle. We don't get a shot off, and that's it. Case and Wallace with a steal. Kentucky walks away with a big win. We basically flip position with them. Now they're in, we're out. It's not a heartbreaker in that respect where it kills the season. But it's, a, it's certainly a missed opportunity for us. Just when it felt like things were turning in the right direction. And again, give Kentucky their due. We knew they were a talented team. They weren't just going to lay down for us. We knew they would come in here. They're fighting for their own tournament lives. But we lost the game, and it sucks. It sucks. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You hate losing to those guys because it's a measuring stick. We're not quite there. And again, this is not a great Kentucky team. So now the Bulldogs will, uh, will look to find a way to win some of these games down the stretch. And, of course, we should be favored in all of them, maybe with the exception of the A&M game. The next one coming up, of course, is uh, Ole Miss this Saturday in Oxford. That is a 2.30 tip from the Pavilion. You need to go sure, be sure and check that out. If you're, into, if you're not going to baseball, you need to be in Oxford. And there are some people that will tell you, hey, don't go to baseball, go to basketball. You make your own decision here. But we need good attendance at both places. One thing I will say, even though you may be dealing with some people you don't want to deal with, you will be indoors at a nice facility if you go watch the basketball team play. It's going to be a little chilly out here. Hey, Bulldog friends. Our friends from Indeed are back, and they are absolutely better than ever. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire candidates all in one place. Your time is valuable. Don't waste multiple hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find the top talent with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like the Indeed Instant Match option, their assessments, and virtual interviews. You hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description exactly the moment they sponsor a job. How cool is that? The best thing about Indeed, too, is, listen, these are names you know. These are people that you can trust. They know that you're trying to grow your own business. 
you got to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Indeed knows hiring needs to be cost-effective when you're running your own business, and many of you are. Put Indeed to work for you today. Visit Indeed.com slash Boneyard to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Terms and conditions may apply. Curse per application. Pricing not available for everyone. You need to hire. You need Indeed. Simple as that. Wendy's 2 for $6 lets you mix and match some of our best items. Like... Dave Single with a 10-piece crispy nugs. Medium strawberry lemonade with a spicy chicken sandwich. Spicy chicken with a Dave Single. Dave Single with a strawberry lemonade. Strawberry lemonade. Strawberry lemonade. If you're into that. Chicken Sam. Crispy nugs. Crispy nugs. Strawberry lemonade. Dave's. Dave's. Nugs. Nugs. Sam. Sam. Whew. Pick what you want at a price you want. <clears throat> Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's two for six. For a limited time, price and participation may vary at U.S. Wendy's. On the card only. Single item at regular price. This week at Macy's, find your new favorite jeans with 40% off Levi's looks for him and her just in time for spring. Or use your coupon or Macy's card and take an extra 15% off handbags and wallets already 40 to 50% off. And take an extra 10% off great furniture and mattress deals too. Plus, Star Rewards members earn rewards even faster during Macy's Star Money bonus days. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Here, look at the Rebels. They are 10 and 16 overall this year, 2 and 11 in the conference. They have lost two in a row. They are 6 and 8 at home, however. So, over half of their wins have come at home. You'd expect that because most of the non conference. Uh, schedule is played on your home floor. But uh, just kind of looking here recently, looking at SEC play, uh, they open up losing to Tennessee, a very competitive game. And, you know, Tennessee just knocked off number one Alabama. Tennessee could be a real challenge for somebody in the NCAA tournament. But uh, Ole Miss is a good job attempting to protect the home floor. They lose by just four to Tennessee. They travel to Alabama, get drilled by 22. Then they come to state, lose by 10. They lose by nine in Oxford to Auburn. And then Georgia gets them 62-58. And so five consecutive losses in the conference. And you butt that up with the fact that they had lost to North Alabama in the final non-conference game. It pushes a losing streak to six straight games. They go to South Carolina. And, you know, South Carolina not good this year. The Rebels win by 12. They didn't travel to Fayetteville. And, you know, anytime you go to Bud Walton Arena, you better bring a lunch. The, the Hogs win by a dozen. Missouri then marches into Oxford, and they get a 12-point win. Ole Miss in the SEC Big 12 Challenge takes on Oklahoma State. They lose by 22 in Stillwater. They make a game of it against Kentucky, but Kentucky again finds a way late, 75-66 to win. Ole Miss then goes to Vanderbilt. They lose by three to a, not a very good team at all. They get off the schneid. <laughs> by going to Georgia. And isn't it ironic that both of Ole Miss's uh, SEC wins this year are on the road? 78-74 winners over a Georgia team that, that, that really had their way with us in many respects. We made the game competitive, but it never felt like we were in control of the game. South Carolina gets a measure of revenge as it's Ole Miss pop it giveaway night, whatever that means. And the Gamecocks go into Oxford and win by three, and then – Florida gets them by 15 down in Gainesville in the O'Connell Center. So, an interesting stretch. Now, Ole Miss folks will wear red tomorrow, so be mindful of that, I guess, in an attempt to show their love for one another. But going to be the red out at the pavilion. You know, it should be an opportunity for us to win a ball game. And and I just wonder, you know, how, how the hangover effect might linger for us. What I mean by that is we should have beaten Kentucky. We have some leadership on this team. We're mature. We have to be able to flush that. You can absorb the loss to Kentucky. You cannot absorb a loss to Ole Miss. Absolutely would be a tournament resume record to lose this game. So we'll just call it what it is. It's a must-win game, not just because of the opponent, but because of the fact that we are fighting for our tournament lives. We went from being uh, last four in and, uh, you know, there's really no point in looking at that stuff right now. we got to go get some Ws together, right? But uh, this Ole Miss team, again, being outscored this year, the net loss is 31 points. Their opponents have scored uh, 31 more points than they have. You'd expect that for a losing team. Uh, shooting 42% from the floor, 
allowing 43%, shooting 29% from beyond the arc, allowing 35%. We're starting to shoot it with, with, with better proficiency beyond the arc. A lot of that Shaquille Moore is kind of finding his game. It's been, it's been fun to watch him. It really has. Wish we had him for a couple more years. Rebounding has been a bit of a strength for Ole Miss. 949 rebounds. They've allowed 890, so it's not like they're dominating the game, but uh, pulling down 36.5 and and allowing 34.5. So just over plus two rebounding. That's got to be a strong suit for us. We've got to go in there and make sure, make sure that we win on the boards against this Ole Miss team. And listen, they've got a couple of guys. They do. They're not winning a lot of games, but it's not like they're completely devoid of talent. Turnovers have been a bit of an issue for them. It's pretty much been, you know, they're stealing the basketball too, but uh, they have not been a great defensive team, and the numbers certainly reflect that. Look at the individual numbers. Uh, Matthew Morrell still leads them. He he has missed a couple of games, but uh, averaging 14.3 points a game, pulling down three and a half rebounds per game. Also has the propensity to turn the basketball over. Jamie Brakefield, the only other Rebel in double figures, 10.2 points per game. He's also pulling down, uh, doing a good job on the glass, five and a half boards a game for him. Uh, so they're, they're kind of rebounding by committee. You don't, you don't have that big post guy down there. Obviously, it's going to get you a double-double. So we need Tolu Smith to kind of get things going. And I, I don't know, listen, I don't know if you guys uh, are aware of this. You know, since we have played those guys, there, there has been some attrition on the roster. And the reasoning at the end of the day doesn't really matter. Now, he did say – that he was making the choice to step away from basketball to focus on his mental and physical health. Uh, if that's the case, we certainly wish the best for that young man and his family. You know, at some point, we all get in stressful situations where you just kind of lose the love of the things you ordinarily have a great passion for. And so we wish him the absolute best. Of course, the, the initial reports were that uh, he had been dismissed from the basketball team. Just not sure if that's true or not. But um, regardless of that, we wish that young man uh, the best as he kind of moves forward. And, and sometimes, sometimes that's a mature thing to do. It's like, hey, this is causing so much stress and anxiety in my life. It's negatively impacting my mental health. I need to take a break. And maybe that's the right move. So we wish him the absolute best with that. But um, So he's no longer a part of the program. He played 11 games this year and uh, started just two. But he was a guy, too, that uh, you know, a lot of people had some high hopes for. You know, out of Callaway High School. You know, he, he's a guy people were ex- excited about. And he, he did play in the ball game against us. He just had a couple points. Uh, 13 minutes, uh, one of eight from the floor. Missed a couple threes and uh, fouled out in the game in just 13 minutes of action. But uh, so, no longer a part of it. And so, we'll kind of move on from there. But, um, you know, Matthew Morrell is the straw that stirs a drink. This is the guy. The problem that he has is he's, he doesn't have enough of a supporting cast around him uh, to really scare you offensively as a team. They're, they're a team that at times will go through these stretches where they, they don't score. And so we've got to are able to defend. We've got to be able to kind of make life frustrating for them. Looking at conference play for them, you know, that's always interesting to see maybe who elevates their game and who doesn't. And to kind of – cycling back to Deshaun Ruffin. He's played in just six SEC games, but he had upped his scoring average. He was uh, nearly double digits at nine and a half points per game. A smaller sample size. I mean, just six conference games. He started one of those, but uh, it seemed like maybe he was rounding back into form, but only he knows, right? Matthew Morrell, though, 13 points a game for him, a little bit down from the overall average, but uh, you know, you're, you're playing better teams, right? So you'd expect there to be a little bit of a change there. And then uh, Jamie and Brakefield, uh, 12.3 points per game uh, in SEC play. Uh, Amari Abram is a guy to watch, too. In SEC play, 7.3 points a game. He has started 13 conference games, which is all of them. Or, excuse me, he started eight, played in all 13, started eight. I guess the only the only Rebel to play to start all 13 SEC games is uh, uh, Jamin Brakefield. So we'll see how things go, but we got to win this game. We absolutely have to win this game because you know what's next, right? You start looking ahead at the schedule or we'll start counting games. Tuesday, you got to go to Missouri. It's a very capable Missouri team. Yes, we beat them here, and they will learn from that experience. They'll attack us differently. They'll defend us differently. 
we've got to find a way to go up there uh, and find a way to win that game. We'll preview that game on Monday show. But when you get through with the Missouri game, you get back-to-back home games against A&M and South Carolina, then you're at Vanderbilt, and that's the end of the slate. That's the end of the regular season. So you can ill afford to drop a game that you're expected to win. I certainly understand that we were favored to beat Kentucky. I don't know if we're ever expected to beat Kentucky, though, to be fair about it. It's kind of like Alabama basketball. Even in a bad year, you're never going to get the benefit of the doubt. But uh, all that said, you're running out of games here to make a move. You know, in recent years, we just found a way to lose these games. I expect us to bounce back and get the W at Ole Miss tomorrow. I certainly have to have that one. It's because it would be an RPI killer. That absolutely crush us in the net. But that gets you to 6-8 and eight in the conference. You need two more to get to 500. You feel like if you can get the 9-7, you've really put yourself in a great position. You get to 8-8, eight and eight, you probably got to win a game or two in the tournament. But you've got Missouri coming up after that. A&M and Starkville, South Carolina and Starkville and Vanderbilt. And again, State should be favored to win most of these games with the exception of A&M. May even be favored at Missouri. Maybe. I haven't looked at the numbers. But uh, again, anytime you got to go on the road in the SEC, it's difficult, especially a place like the Mizzou Center. They love their basketball up there. And even in mediocre years, they turn out and support that team. We're going to see a different, a different, a different opportunity for sure than we had before. I don't think there's any question. I think we're going to see Missouri really bring a good effort, and so we're probably going to have to bring our best effort uh, to win that game. Be a huge win for us. That's the thing you start thinking. You start stacking up a couple of uh, road wins there down the stretch. Even though Ole Miss is not a tournament team, it's still a league game. You're able to knock that thing down. And you go to Missouri, a place where the Tigers are 14-2 and two this year at home. Yeah, so it's going to be a difficult opportunity, to say the least. We're going to have to find a way to get it done, though. Absolutely got to find a way to get it done. Uh, they're looking at their home losses. They lose to Alabama back on January 21st. And... Um, I guess they lost in a non-conference. Yeah, you, you, out, there's no shame in losing to this great Alabama team, right? None whatsoever. They did take down Kentucky kind of considerably there. Yeah, they lost to Kansas. So they lost to two top ten teams in their home arena and then swept the rest of the competition. And, again, that's going to be a, you know, something we'll talk more about on Monday. But losing that Kentucky game, not a killer for us, but it certainly didn't help us. Got to find a way to get three of these last five. You absolutely have to find a way because that, you know, that, that puts you in a situation now where um, – and sometimes I get confused because you toggle them back and forth between the men and the women. But uh, you, you feel like if you, can, if you can finish eight and ten in a conference, you've got a chance. If you can find a way to get to nine and finish 500, it's even better. So, again – I lose my place here. All right, so one, two, three, four, five conference games left. Five left, and you are uh, currently five and eight in the conference. So you got to get at least three of these games. And then, uh, then, uh, then you probably still got to win a game in the, in, the, in the conference tournament. So let's get Ole Miss, and you feel like you can get South Carolina and Vanderbilt. Can you get Missouri and A&M? Can you get one of those two? But I think if you end, end up winning four of the last five, I think it puts you in a, a really good situation. But, uh, again, if we had beaten that Kentucky team and extended that winning streak to six, we're having a different conversation today. Going into Oxford with a full head of steam, no matter the circumstances, we got to go get that dub. Absolutely got to go get it. I keep belaboring that point. Not just because it's Ole Miss. It would be great to sweep those guys. But if you lose this game here, Short of uh, making a deep run into the SEC tournament or maybe winning out the regular season slate, we're not making a tournament. We're going to be in NIT all the way. You absolutely can't afford to lose that game. Because if you lose that one and then all of a sudden you, you go and you get beat by Missouri, all of a sudden you've run that losing streak to three with three to play, and really the only RPI opportunity or net opportunity you have is an A&M team that just beat Arkansas. Uh, and, again, I think A&M is probably not as good as their conference record reflects, but any time that you beat the Razorbacks, it's a big deal, home or away. So we didn't make life easier on ourselves, but we could compound that if we let it hang around. And all of a sudden, you, 
back-to-back road games. You drop that game tomorrow and you limp up there to Missouri. Uh, you might as well get ready for an NIT bid. So we're still playing meaningful basketball. You know, one loss is not going to define the season, but the reality of it is is we can't allow Kentucky to beat us twice. we got to go get this Oxford game, and then we'll see what happens on Tuesday when we make the trip up to, uh, to Missouri. Our right, time for today's top ten list is always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Blair is a mortgage professional. Blair is a guy that gets things done. Anybody that has been in any industry for 20-plus years is not hanging around out of luck. They're there because of skill, know-how, and productivity. And that's Blair. Top 1% close ratio in the country back-to-back years. Works for Fairway Mortgage, one of the top mortgage loan origination companies in the country. Number one in customer satisfaction, according to a recent survey. Give Blair a text or call today at 601-500-2344. 601-500-2344. Maybe you're looking to refinance. Maybe you're looking to get a first mortgage. There are a lot of people out there that will tell you, you know, Steve, I've I've never tried or I've tried before and I've been disappointed. Maybe maybe give it another chance. Maybe you had the wrong loan officer. Maybe it just wasn't the right time for you. Maybe you're out of your lane a little bit. Maybe you were looking at a property perhaps that you couldn't afford. Maybe your DTI was too high. Work with Blair to find out what kind of budget you're looking for before you even go shopping for homes. Because you know how it is. You start falling in love, and you say, you know what? If I can just get this loan, we'll make it work. Then you put yourself in a more stressful situation. So Blair can get you pre-qualified. I would encourage you to do that. Begin the process with him before you start identifying properties. So we want to start looking for a house. Maybe you're fresh out of college. Maybe you're a newly wed couple. And sadly, maybe you're newly divorced, you know. And your credit's not racked. Maybe it is. Blair has seen it all and done it all. Reach out to Blair today. Let's get you a new home. Rather than you getting on the hamster wheel of renting, let's get you in a house somewhere so you can build some equity and build some generational wealth and have something to leave your kids at some point. That's close at Blair.com. And mention to him, when you speak to him, whether it be by text or email or whatever, that you heard about him on the bone yard, he's going to pay for your appraisal, and that's about a $500 value. Be sure and check it out today at closeofblair.com, which segues into Blair's request. Anytime the sponsor says, hey, let's do this top 10 list, we're going to do this top 10 list. So Blair was inspired by our list on Monday. He said, hey, what about movies about music, about bands? I said, you know what? I can do this. Blair, you've come to the right place. There will be no jam bands. There will be no uh, British rave music here. We're not going to do that. It is a very diverse list, though. So many of you are going to say, Steve, I don't agree, and that's cool, too. That's fine. There are some legendary movies on this list, and we're going to pull a song from each soundtrack so Roy can put a list together for you. You'll have some music to listen to and perhaps some movies to watch. How about that? All right, number 10, and I'll tell you, this this goes back several years for me. But it seems like every time that it's on cable or whatever, if I stumble across it, I watch it. I've become more of a Netflix person in recent years. But the movie with Richie Valens, La Bamba, it was great. Lou Diamond Phillips played the lead in it. It was phenomenal start to finish. Of course, uh, Richie died in that terrible plane crash. Very talented guy. Didn't necessarily live the most um, blessed life, I guess you could say. It was dirt poor, learned to play the guitar, brought some joy to his friends and his family, and, and became uh, you know a radio star. So we're going to go with the title track from that movie. We're going to go with La Bamba which is actually a cover song, but Richie, of course, is the one that made it famous. All right, number nine. And again, I'm ranking these, in many respects, off of the quality of the movie, just so you know. Just so you know. Not necessarily the song itself, but the, uh, the quality of the movie. Walk the Line is fantastic. Reese Witherspoon, Jaqueen Phoenix. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you. Uh, Phoenix, Jaqueen Phoenix, or why... I don't know I'm going to mispronounce it, but uh, he did most of the vocal stuff himself. And, of course, they mix it and everything else, but it wasn't just uh, him lip syncing. 
We could have gone a lot of different directions here. Could have gone with Jackson. We didn't. We're going with Ring of Fire from Johnny Cash is your number nine song today. Number nine, Johnny Cash, Ring of Fire. It's part of the Walk the Line soundtrack. Number eight, this is not about a band. It's about a bunch of bands. The movie absolutely tanked. Absolutely tanked. Uh, Taylor Hawkins from Foo Fighters, God Rest His Soul, was in this movie. It was a star-studded cast. It did not do well at all in limited release. It's about CBGB. And a lot of people say, well, Steve, CBGB's closed now. It's a legendary rock place. A lot of people don't even understand what it means. I have the shirt in honor of CBGB. You know, it says CBGB O-M-F-U-G. And people think it means something profound or profound or or they think it means something uh, inappropriate. It doesn't. It's country, bluegrass, blues, and other music for uplifting generations. That's what it means. It's not some acronym from, for some dirty thing or something. That's what it means. And so in the beginning, it was for everybody. CBGB was just a place, a performance hall, and then it became kind of the home of American punk. In honor of that, we're going to honor Iggy Pop today. Your number eight song is The Stooges, I Want to Be Your Dog. Probably the signature song from The Stooges. Number seven, this goes back uh, to my youth, and I, I'm from the 1900s. And this goes back to when I was really young, back when we still had a black and white TV. You had to get out there and, and change the rabbit ears, and many of you young people will not understand the reference. It was basically a little antenna you could buy to improve your, your reception on your TV. We only had four channels. You had ABC, CBS, NBC, and then you know UHF. You had what, Channel 45 in South Mississippi. That was it. That was the Mississippi Public Broadcasting Network. We watched that a lot because a lot of the programming was uh, for kids. This was released in 75. I don't know when I saw it because I think everybody was scared of Ann Margaret. I was not scared of Ann Margaret, even as a young person. And uh, she recently passed away. Ann Margaret, of course, uh, the girlfriend of one Elvis Presley for a while. And an absolutely beautiful and talented woman. She was, in many respects, the star of Tommy, the movie. And The Who, of course, had this uh, concept album. And uh, it became a movie. And there's that big bean scene with Ann Margaret that's so weird and over the top and everything. And, and only Ann Margaret could make big beans look attractive. But uh, we're going with the Pinball Wizard as our track today from The Who. And so Ann Margaret is basically, she's not the protagonist, but she is a major character in the film. And she's fooling around, and <clears throat> her paramour kills her husband, who is Tommy's father. And Tommy sees all this. And then he goes into this deep and dark depression, and all of a sudden he becomes a pinball wizard, and there's all this craziness that goes along with it. But uh, it is a crazy, crazy, crazy movie with an amazing soundtrack. I'm not a big Who fan, but a lot of people are. And so we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the magic between the movie and the music here. So Tommy the movie. Check it out. Number six. A lot of you have seen this too. A lot of people that are Who fans are also Pink Floyd fans. I'm not a huge Pink Floyd fan, and many of you are. And uh, I really got into Pink Floyd towards the end of my uh, drinking and drugging career for obvious reasons, right? Because people kind of gravitate in that direction. That whole, uh, that whole scene, the shaving scene in the wall, even to this day, I don't like watching that. This kind of, I don't know, it just bothers me. But um, all that said, number six, we're going to go with Pink Floyd, The Wall. It's the movie and from the soundtrack, The Wall. Hey, teachers, leave those kids alone. All right, number five, I still watch this movie too. I watch it whenever it comes on. If I ever catch it, I don't care if it's 20 minutes in or 20 minutes to go, I'll watch it. We talk about it on this show a lot too. I, I think it's probably one of the best kind of musical documentary, and maybe that's not the right way to do it. I mean, it's not an opera per se, but it's, it, is a, it is basically a movie that showcases music, one of the best soundtracks of all time. It's Prince's Purple Rain. We didn't have this on the Monday list, and, and Roy was like, oh, we didn't do that. No, we didn't. And Because and, Prince and Revolution is not a fake band, right? They, and they played themselves, even though they were you know kid and the Revolution. It was, it was Prince's music, right? And so I just kind of felt like that was a little bit of a misnomer. But we're going to work it in today. Anytime we can celebrate the genius of Prince on this show, we're going to do that. I love Prince. 
gone way too soon. I remember the day that he died, it, I was like, I was in my other office then, and I was like, what? Did, what? What? It's amazing. It really is. And I don't know if it was a uh, accidental overdose or somebody poisoned him or whatever, but uh, drugs will kill you, man. They will. And it's a shame that so many of our most talented people have been lost to d- addiction. And the thing that I've learned, and I guess in many respects being a creative person myself, many of our greatest talents, and I don't include myself in that, so don't get me wrong, um, are also very tortured souls. There are people that like that it's difficult to process pain, so they express their pain through their art. And we resonate as a people because there's a lot of commonality in the struggle of being human, right? And so I've got this big theory too, and and maybe you disagree, but I think one of the things that um, that a lot of people don't fully appreciate, like there'll be some bands, and uh, I'm I'm not going to name them because somebody will get offended, but uh, there are some bands, it's like they hit the ground running, and they're like, they're so incredibly strong and vocal, and they're sharing their struggle and we identify with it and then all of a sudden they have some measure of success and they begin to mellow and it's like oh they sold out well it's not that they sold out they healed all of a sudden they're not having to eat you know cold cuts right out of the the wrapper they can afford the bread now they can afford to go have a decent meal so life has changed for them so as a result their outlook on life has changed and it impacts their art this is how things are but a lot of people would say, oh, they sold out. Well, it's not that they sold out. It's just maybe they grew up a little bit. You know, it's like the whole thing with, like, Tool is a great example. When Maynard and Tool hit the scene, everybody's like, oh, my gosh, it's incredible. Well, then all of a sudden, Maynard begins to uh, try some other projects, and he does Pussifer, and he does Perfect Circle. And, yeah, it's still Maynard, but it's not as aggressive or angry. And it's like, well, what's going on with this guy? Well, I mean, he's healing. That's what happens with a lot of people. It's like, you know, I can think Stephen Tower said it best. He said, you know, until we learn how to express ourselves, we're all just bozos on the bus. And it's true. You got to find a way, an outlet, a creative outlet to share that. You know, and I, and I struggle with that sometimes too. You know, I do. I identify with that. Obviously, I'm not nearly as talented as those people. But it's like, you know, I think the quality of my work, obviously, when I'm happy, and happy is a state of mind. Like, it's, and I don't want to chase this rabbit trail long. I, I love these people that are like, well, I just want to be happy. I, you know, Happy is, happy is a byproduct of a lot of different things. You're never just going to be happy all the time. Nobody is. So if your only goal is to be happy, what do you do when you're sad? What do you do when you're indifferent? You know, m- my goal is to be in love. Because if you're in love, it's like everything else kind of takes care of itself. Because happiness comes and goes. It does. And so when you are happy, though, you know, obviously you're going to be a little more, more productive. You know, I'm, I'm a person, too. Like, when I'm not doing good, I'm not working hard. And it's amazing how that works. All of a sudden, you start producing more content. You get productive. You get out and you paint the garage and do stuff like that. All of a sudden, you start feeling better about yourself. And all of a sudden, you start feeling the, uh, the, the sun rays of happiness kind of cross your life. But nevertheless, that was free. All right, number four, and I love this movie. I was not a huge fan of this band, even though they're a classic band, until I saw the movie. When Oliver Stone did The Doors and Val Kilmer, our hero from Doc Holliday in uh, Tombstone, I thought Val Kilmer was incredible as Jim Morrison. And all of a sudden, I thought, you know, maybe I've been wrong about The Doors. And so all of a sudden, you know, I hear these great songs and stuff, and you know, I know the stories behind them. I'm like, hey, you know what? Let me give The Doors another chance. We're going to go, people are strange from The Doors. If you've never seen The Doors, I think you should. All these movies are great in some respects. But I think The Doors is one of those movies I think everybody should watch. Even if you don't like The Doors, I think the, um, you know, maybe the, the deep dive into who Jim Morrison was as a person will give you some new insight to him as an artist. Another guy that was a tortured soul. Absolutely incredible talent. Gone way too soon. All right, number three. I know that I'm going to get some texts about this. I got one friend in particular who's the biggest Beatles fan that I know. And he's going to say, hey, you should have done this one. You should have done that one. Well, I took my kids to see the movie yesterday. And we all loved it. 
we did, and it made them fans of the Beatles. And my youngest, Ian, has a Beatles playlist now because all of a sudden he's like, man, these guys were really good. Yeah, 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 they were, kid, they were. It's incredible. And so I think the movie yesterday turned a new generation of fans onto the Beatles. And if you've not seen the movie, you should. It is an incredible movie. Of course, it's very far-fetched. It could never happen. But the premise of the movie is this guy has an accident. Like He is a huge Beatles fan. Like He is just one of these kinds of people that is totally obsessed with the Beatles, believes they are the greatest recording act of all time. And then there's this accident, and it's like the Beatles have been erased from world history. Like He's like the only person in the world that remembers the Beatles. And so he starts playing the Beatles songs, and people are like, oh, my gosh, what a talent. And the first song that he plays is Yesterday. He's, like, sitting around with some friends. He starts playing Yesterday, and people are, like, crying, like, dear Lord, where did, did you write that? Is that one of your own? And he's like, you guys are kidding me, right? That's, that's Yesterday from the Beatles, written by John Lennon. They're like, who? And so he gets online and does all this search and stuff, and the Beatles have been completely erased. And so that's what he does. And he becomes this mega superstar by performing the Beatles songs. And you'll have to watch the movie to see how it ends. It's, um, it's a very good ending. It's a very good heartwarming movie. And it also shows the struggle, you know, the struggle of people uh, trying to find a kind of find their way in the world. You know, because a lot of people in many respects, I mean, you know, you know they, they talk about faking it till you make it. You know, it's a big part of that. There, there's a price to pay for that too, though. There really is. All right, number two, and you probably knew this one was coming, and uh, Roy and uh, Blair were both on board with this one. I almost watched it again last night. I probably watched it a dozen times, but it's uh, Molly Cruz the Dirt. Molly Cruz the Dirt. It is uh, loosely based on actual events. They worked in a few things from the book, The Dirt, that Nikki Six wrote that is uh, autobiographical. And uh, I also have John Karabi's autobiography, uh, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. I haven't read it yet. Of course, John was the uh, second singer in Motley Crue. Haven't read it yet. I've met John and uh, I've met Vince a couple times. But I, The Dirt is great. I think it probably should have been about an hour longer, to be honest with you. I thought they rushed a little bit of the end. You know, I think it was like, okay, we've told all these funny stories and we've dealt with this tragedy and Tommy's had domestic violence charges and Nikki died and Vince uh, had a car accident that killed somebody and Mick's got all these health issues and uh, I thought they rushed the ending a little bit, but I still loved it. And uh, I love the fact that uh, Motley is now playing stadiums again. They're on a world tour right now down in Mexico. It's great. And there's a lot of rumors there's going to be new music. I don't know if I, how I agree with that. I don't know. This Mick jump in there. And there's so much stuff about Mick. You know, Mick is no longer touring with the band. There are some people that believe he was forced out. Other people think he actually retired, but then he retires and immediately goes in the studio with some other people. Mick also has a solo album in the can that has not been released. There are some people that believe that uh, they didn't want that album released because they didn't want it competing with Motley. I think it would have added to Motley. But, you know, we'll see. But uh, the first song that Motley played as a band in the movie in a, in a rehearsal apartment when Vince came and showed up was uh, Livewire. So we're going to go with that one. Livewire from the Too Fast for Love album is your number two track from The Dirt. Number one, and this may not be a surprise to you, and if it is, you hadn't been paying attention, but it's Bohemian Rhapsody from Queen. All hail the Queen. I've been a Queen fan my entire life. Told you guys before, the very first record I bought with my own money at eight years of age. Took my birthday money, and I'd been scrolling away nickels and dimes and anything that I could ever find. And I got my birthday money, and I bought Queen the Game, full-length LP. The first record I ever had with my own money. And I still have it. Still have it. It's in my mom's house, but I, you know, it's still around. And I remember putting that thing on and the freedom that I got from being able to listen to Another One Bites of Dust anytime I wanted to, it changed me. It did. It changed me as a person. Like, I own this song now. I can listen to it whenever I want to. I can sit in my room, put the needle on the record, and I can listen to this. And uh, there's so many other great tracks on there. It's a classic album. 
but I was a Queen fan at a very young age, and I've told you guys on the show before, there were so many people that were very critical of Freddie Mercury and uh, his lifestyle, and I think it was really unfair. And, of course, it was a much different time back then. I think Freddie today would be would be ha- hailed in a much greater light. And I remember the day when the news broke that, that Freddie had AIDS, and I remember how devastating that was, and then he was gone in no time after that. But Freddie was absolutely hounded by the press. There was so many rumors out there, you know, about his life. And he finally made a statement. <clears throat> and no, no clue when it was actually written. But following enormous conjecture in the press, I wish to confirm that I have been tested HIV positive and have AIDS. I felt it correct to keep this information private in order to protect the privacy of those around me. However, the time has now come for my friends and fans around the world to know the truth. And I hope everyone will join with me my doctors, and all those worldwide in the fight against this terrible disease. And that was it. That was it. And I don't know what we gained by that confirmation. I mean, did it change anything? I mean, did it change his legacy? Were there people around back then that, um, you know, felt some sense of, uh, of glee for being correct? That one of the greatest front men of all time was terminally ill. Yeah, I, I look back on it now and I think to myself how, how incredibly selfish it all was. Very, 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 very selfish. And uh, this man's privacy, of course, he was a public figure. I mean, so it's difficult to keep things private, especially when you were as flamboyant as Freddie Mercury. It was almost like people wanted to hang a scarlet letter around his neck. It was offensive to me then. It's offensive to me now. So we'll celebrate Freddie Mercury and the great music of Queen every chance we get on the show. And I was so honored to be able to take my children to watch Bohemian Rhapsody. I get emotional thinking about it. Because Freddie Mercury was more than just a singer to me. It's like he's one of those kind of people. It was like, especially when you get to know his story and his humble beginnings, and you think this is a guy that came from nothing and became, at the time, the greatest singer in the world. He was known worldwide. And it's just proof positive that dreams can come true. It also is a reminder, too, that many of our heroes have a tragic flaw. But it's their flaw. It's not ours to own. It's not ours to criticize. None of us are perfect. And Freddie was a guy that lived life to excess. And it caught up with him. It did. It doesn't make his contributions to the world any less valid. And so I say that, and I feel like that I'm you know, preaching today, but the reality of it is, is I went with my kids, and uh, they immediately became Queen fans. Like they, Of course, it's one thing to hear the music as you, you know, through your youth, and you kind of grow up with it, and there's this air of familiarity with it. But I think once they saw you know, the, the, the genius of Freddie Mercury, who I still contend is the greatest frontman of all time, some people would say, oh, there's Steve, there's Mick Jagger, and there's... Roger Daltrey, and there's Axl Rose, and there's Sebastian Bach, and they're all great. They are, but they're all playing for second, in my estimation. Maybe you disagree, but Bohemian Rhapsody, one of the greatest contributions to rock and roll of all time, and uh, I think watching the movie and seeing the recording of all that and and how it all kind of came to be gave me a greater appreciation for the genius behind the song Bohemian Rhapsody. And thank you to uh, Mike Myers and Dana Carvey for Wayne's World for reintroducing the glory of Bohemian Rhapsody to a new generation. There are a lot of people that have never even heard that song until Wayne's World comes out. And I hope it's one of those things that kind of carries on and carries forward. And, and there are just some songs that, that you can't cover out of respect. This is one of them. This is one of those songs that I hope nobody ever covers. And there may be a few people that do it in, in live performances, but uh, there are just some songs you don't mess with. This is one of them. So if you haven't seen Bohemian Rhapsody, I encourage you to watch it. I think it's an education. And I think it also, too, uh, maybe in some respects today, maybe it shows the progress that we've made in many respects when it's come to you know, tolerance of other people. Because here's at the end of the day, You know, when I go stand before God myself, I'm only going to be responsible for the life that I led. 
I'm not going to be held accountable for how many times I was right about somebody else's life. Right? It's the measure of your own deeds. It's the measure of your decision, you know, of your salvation, right? I mean, that, that's, all, that's all part of it. I'm not going to be held accountable for the records that I listened to and the lives that the artist led. You know, it's not, so I shouldn't feel this, this sting of indictment. And again, I go back to being a kid, you know, being, uh, you know, being the grandson of a pastor, you know, and the great grandson of a pastor, you know, and uh, you know, my, my mom, of course, and stepdad raised us in the church. And, and so sometimes, like, you hear things and, and at times, and uh, you begin to kind of study for yourself, and you realize that some people have probably taken the most literal interpretation of something as possible. And uh, you begin to develop your own values. But I'm very grateful to be from a Levite tribe and to have had that foundation, but to also have, uh, have found my own beliefs. Right. And obviously they mirror many of theirs, but uh, there are some things obviously I think I think especially my mom, I think I would say this. I, I think that I had probably helped her in many respects, you know, growing up in South Mississippi. Of course, you know, you, you kind of have tunnel vision. Right. I mean, it's like this is what we do and who we are and anybody's different from us. I think I've helped my mom. I think part of it's me growing my hair out. It sounds crazy, but I think it's the reality. I think I think in some respects I've helped my mother. Maybe be a little more accepting to people that maybe aren't as, aren't exactly like her, and uh, I think that is a wonderful thing about life, is that as as things move forward, you know, I think about my own kids, how much I've learned from them, you know, and, and there have been times that we have had knockdown dragouts, you know, I mean honestly, you know, and then all of a sudden I'll when when the temperature kind of cools a little bit, I'll start thinking about it because you know I think they might be right. I think I may be wrong about this. And I think that's part of growing up and being mature is not being quite so rigid and understanding that um, I think things sometimes that we're taught may not be correct. All right, next segment of the show brought to you as always by Campus Bookmart. If you haven't been to Campus Bookmart, what are you doing with your life? The greatest selection of Mississippi State merchandise available in the known universe. Here's a Campus Bookmark. When you're in town this weekend checking out the Diamond Dogs, go by and get some new gear. You probably need a new hoodie anyway. Go by there and peruse their fine selection. If you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That will get you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bucks, absolutely incomplete. I feel confident you're going to need that. Again, it's campusbookmart.net, promo code BSR. All right, we talked about the Kentucky game and how that is perhaps um, you know, not something we can't overcome. The loss last night on the women's side to Missouri, that is a dream killer right there. That is an absolute dream killer. And now you start thinking you're running out of opportunities, and we absolutely are. Two home games left. Got to win them both. Got to win them both. Got to beat Alabama. Got to beat Arkansas. And now you're looking at a situation now, too. And I had somebody remind me on Facebook, said, hey, Steve, let's give the ladies a chance against LSU. I don't think we have much of a chance down there, but you're exactly right. There's a reason we play the games. That's true. On any given day, you can go out there and you can get a W. You never know. And so, not ready to count that as a loss, but uh, I'm leaning in that direction. State gets out to a good start last night, 16-10 to 10 after the first quarter. You think, okay, we'll build on this. Well, we don't. They make some defensive adjustments and outscore us by 10 to take a four-point lead at the half. And you're thinking, okay, we're good here. We're good. We're good. We'll overcome this. We'll adjust. Well, then they win the third quarter, 21-17, to push the lead out to eight. It was just too much for us to overcome in the fourth quarter. We do cut into it a little bit, but ultimately lose uh, 75-62. They outscore us by five there in the uh, in the fourth quarter when it's all said and done. We just, you know, the final minutes, just things kind of unraveled for us. So you lose by 13 on the road to a team that was 4-8 and eight in the SEC, a team that had been more competitive in the last couple ball games. But we're now 18 and 8 and 7 and 6 in the league, and they're 16 and 10. 
that does not help. That doesn't help at all. That is an absolute net drainer right there. 2,698 paid to see it. Uh, Alana Smith led the Bulldogs with 17 points. Uh, Jerkayla Jordan with 14 and off the bench. Azanae Johnson with 11. We just we simply can't get it done without Jessica Carter. We just can't. Can't get it done. Can't get it done. And um, those are the things that stick with you. You know, that, that's just what happens. And we shot it pretty good in the third quarter, but um, not good. In the second half, we're 5 of 18 from beyond the arc. That won't get it done either. 5 of 14 in the first half. Just can't get it done. Points in the paint for us, 22. Points in the paint for Missouri, also 22. So kind of a, uh, you know, a trade-off there. But, um, you know, their bench uh, outscored ours. Or excuse me, we actually – we're even there too. I, I, I looked at the wrong number there, but uh, uh, the bottom line is is that uh, we couldn't get it done. Haley Frank with 22 for Missouri. Lauren Hansen with 20. We we expected them to be the two main cogs. They have been Haley Troop with uh, with just five points. Did a pretty good job on her. But the reality of it is is we lost the game. We couldn't afford to lose, and now we're stuck. We were listed as the last team in, and now we've got. <laughs> A very difficult task in front of us to overcome that. You beat Alabama and you're Arkansas, you're probably back in. You lose to LSU, then you probably got to win a game or two in the tournament to make it even a possibility. So we're jockeying for position right now. And this is just one of those games you look at. There's no explaining it away. There's no way to feel good about it. There's no way to look at it and say, well, these things happen. That's a game you can't lose. You simply can't lose it. And we do. And then, uh, you know, we're still kind of where we need to be, I guess, in the standings. You know, sixth in the SEC tied with Georgia. But Georgia, of course, uh, has the victory over us. Alabama now 9-4. And, four. and uh, Arkansas 6-7. and seven. But you look at those games, and they're must-wins. Absolute must-wins. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. I don't think anybody can look at that and think, you know what? We're going to be okay. Just not the case. And uh, I'll be honest with you. If we don't make the tournament, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm not going to be disappointed with uh, with Sam, but I'm going to be disappointed in the fact that we probably missed an opportunity here. Uh, not an indictment on him in year one. We need to play as much as we can. But I feel like the pieces on this team are there. So Alabama will be in Humphrey Coliseum for senior day on Sunday. Again, it's a 430 tip. You can watch it on the SEC Network Plus. So you'll need your app. And then Thursday, Greg Knight. Please turn out, students, 8 p.m. tip. That will be broadcast on the SEC Network. But looking at Alabama, you know, this is a team, too, that's ahead of us in the standings. We're, we're chasing them. They open SEC play with a win over Georgia. They lose at Tennessee in a competitive game. Missouri gets them by one in Tuscaloosa. They beat Auburn at Auburn. They beat Ole Miss at Ole Miss. They beat A&M, but everybody does. They didn't lose to LSU. I mean, it is an absolute bloodbath. They lose by 38 in that game at home. They didn't go to Arkansas, pull out a three-point win, a competitive game against South Carolina at home. They lose by just seven. Then they beat Missouri 76-69. So they split with the Tigers. They win at Kentucky. They sweep Auburn. They get Vandy by 18 uh, last night. So they have now won four games in a row, so they are trending in the right direction. We're going to need a great turnout and we're going to need our fans to kind of be the sixth lady on the floor for this ball game. But that's one, again, there's just no way that I can put lipstick on that pig and sit here and tell you everything's going to be okay. Because I don't believe it. If had we won that game, and then you find a way to get at least one more, I think you feel good about where you stand. We needed to win at least two of the last four. Well, now we're down to a situation where we got to get two of the last three. If you can get all three, you feel great about life because that last one's a huge RPI net boost. I just don't know if we're capable of getting it done. And so if we lose three of these last four, I think it's pretty safe to say, short of us making the final in the SEC tournament, we're headed to the women's NIT. And, uh, you know, again, that's not an indictment on Sam Purcell. He'll tell you that it is. 
He'll tell you he should have got it done. He'll tell you they should have found a way to win. But that's one. Missouri has been a difficult place for us to go play over the years. But we have not been a great road team uh, this year. You know, look, looking at SEC play, you know, you get that win on the road at Vanderbilt to open it up. You lose at Tennessee, no shame in that. You win at A&M, but again, everybody does these days. You lose at Ole Miss, you lose at Georgia. You find a way to win at Florida, which was big. It was. And you lose at Missouri. It's tough to win on the road in any sport in this league, but the reality of it is is we, we should have won last night and we didn't. And there are a lot of things that you can say about that ball game, but the best thing about it is it's behind us now. We've got to find a way to win these next two. And then we can start talking about it. You beat Alabama, all of a sudden you think, okay, the dream is still alive. You beat Arkansas, you think, okay, the dream is close to being realized. We're not going to be penalized for what happens at Baton Rouge. But you probably put yourself in a situation where you need a win or two in the tournament. That's important to understand. And uh, Alabama, you know, for a while there, we kind of ran that series. You know, we won at one stretch there, you know, six consecutive, six consecutive games against them. Felt really good about it. Hadn't always worked out here. You know, there have been some years Alabama's been much better than us. I mean, there were, there were years there that we weren't even competitive in women's basketball. But it's been a much different dynamic here. You know, after we won those, you know, those six in a row, then we, we lost back-to-back years in Starkville to Alabama. And then we lost last year to them in Tuscaloosa. So you win – excuse me, that was two years ago. You win last year in Tuscaloosa by three – and you feel pretty good about life. And that snapped, obviously, a three-game losing streak against them. But uh, So you've won, you know, I guess, what's, what's that, seven out of the last ten against them? But in many respects, I think you would say, you know what, that they're playing pretty good basketball right now, perhaps their best basketball of the season. So we're going to have to bring a great effort, and everybody's going to have to be excited about it. And, uh, again, that's a 4.30 tip. Please turn out. They'll have the kids' court deal before the game, all kids 12 and under. Let the kids come be a part of that as we celebrate a uh, senior class that's injured an awful lot. They signed on to be part of a championship program. Many of them did, and several of them have left the program. But they, you know, they, they committed to Mississippi State and felt like, hey, this is where I can make, make my future here. And maybe they hadn't got the return on that, that same investment. And some of that's them, right? I mean, let's be honest about that too. Some of that's them. You've got to strike while the iron is hot. I mean, a coach can't go make shots for you. They can put you in a position to be successful, but you got to go execute. We didn't execute last night. So, Alabama Sunday, 430, be there or be square. Final segment of the show is always brought to you by Portico. If I was moving to Starkville now, I'd move to Portico. I've made that abundantly clear over the years. Portico, a great place to live, a great place to maybe have it as your ballgame weekend retreat. Maybe you're a kind of person that wants to have um, – you know, a place to stay and a place to keep all your tailgating equipment so you don't have to carry it back and forth to Memphis or Jackson or Birmingham or wherever you live. Maybe you can afford to have a second home. I would encourage you to give Brooks Bryan a text or call today at 601-416-8075. Again, at 601-416-8075. Portico, very easy to find. You turn off 82 on a 12 like going to campus. The very first ride is Pat Station Road. You've passed that road a million times coming to campus, Right. You never knew where it went. Well, now it's a thoroughfare there. It's not a dead end anymore. You go through that four-way stop, and on the right-hand side, there's Portico. Give yourself a self-guided tour when you're in camp- on campus this weekend. You say, hey, Steve, we're, st- we're staying a weekend. Rather than continuing to uh, invest in our hospitality industry, maybe it's time that you bought a home up here. Make it your primary residence. Again, make it your second home, perhaps an investment property. You can start with a two-bath two-bedroom home and go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home and anything in between. If you need a custom build, they can accommodate that too. Phase one's completely sold out. Phase two under development. Many of those homes are sold, but not all of them. And also too, there are some lots you can pick out and have some say in your housing plans. Be sure and check that out today. Again, that's Portico. Make it your next move. All right, let's look at the baseball weekend. Uh, I'm eager to see all of this play out. And I don't even really care who wins outside of us, right? Of course, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be rooting against the SEC. I don't know how you guys are. But uh, I don't root for anybody that uh, hurts us, right? And I know a lot of people love that SEC chant. 
like SEC, SEC. Yeah, it's really cool. And uh, there is some esprit de corps. I guess, you know, the reality of it is, is I want the league to be good, but I want us to be at the top of it. And I know, listen, I, I love to go to these tournaments and be able to watch everybody play. But I'm pulling against everybody that is um, competing with us. It runs deep with me. Maybe you're different. I don't know. So here's your schedule today. Uh, While we're recording this show, Oklahoma State is currently beating Missouri. No real surprise there. Uh, Jacksonville State will be at Georgia. The Richmond Spiders will be at Alabama. Of course, VMI is here. That's a 3 p.m. first pitch. Matter of fact, once I wrap this up and publish this, I'll be headed to Duty Noble Field. Western Michigan's at LSU. Kentucky is at Elon. No TV for that game. UMass Lowell is at South Carolina. Vandy is uh, going to play TCU today as part of a round-robin event there. The Delaware Blue Hens are at Oxford. Indiana is at Auburn. That could be an interesting series there. Charleston Southern at Florida. Seattle U at A&M. Tennessee is at Arizona. Uh, and then Arkansas is playing Texas. Again, some of these teams are, are part of, a, uh, of an event. And uh, so I want to give you, you know, real quickly here, you know, my thoughts about the league this year. There are a lot of people that uh, see things a little bit differently than me, and that's okay. I didn't get a chance to see everybody play in the fall, right? Nor did anybody else. That's kind of part of the deal. Oklahoma State will play Vanderbilt tomorrow. Just kind of looking through here, too. Uh, Missouri will play Texas. Tennessee will play Grand Canyon. Arkansas plays TCU. And then looking at Sunday's games, Texas plays Vanderbilt. Who do you root for there? I think you got to root for Texas, right? Uh, let's see here. Arkansas plays Oklahoma State. Missouri plays TCU. So nice little event down there involving some SEC teams. So here, here are my thoughts. Um, I do think Mississippi State is better than people are giving us credit for. Now, I admit there are a lot of questions about this team, and they all center around pitching. Now, looking at how everybody sees this thing play out, if I can find the uh, – we'll we'll sit here and grab the the SEC predictions, right? So we'll start in the East. I'm going to go a little bit crazy here. I don't think – I think Missouri is good enough to pick up a couple of doves here and there. I do think this is probably the last year there, unless they just don't care about baseball. I do have Missouri finishing seventh. I think Kentucky is actually going to be a little bit better than people anticipate. Do they make the tournament? I don't know about that. But I would say Kentucky, Georgia, South Carolina are all going to be about the same. Every single one of them. I think that's an, an important aspect of all of this is that you have to consider that there's a lot of this, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to baseball. You always got to avoid the sweep. And I think that Kentucky is going to be good enough to do that. And I think they will stay in the race to Hoover. And I think South Carolina is a little bit overvalued. I think much can be said about Georgia, too. I think those three teams are very much equal. And I won't be surprised to see Kentucky win one of those series. And again, I don't understand why they're at Elon. And, and if, you, if you're interested in watching that, that's uh, Flow Sports this weekend. Kentucky at Elon. But uh, the non-conference schedule is favorable for Kentucky. They did not schedule especially difficult. The, the final non-conference game before conference play, before we had the Lexington, they will play Indiana. That's kind of a spicy midweek game. And then we're there for the three-game set. And then uh, Kentucky goes to Alabama. They will host Missouri, and that's one you absolutely, you absolutely have to win that one. They travel to Georgia. That's big. They travel to LSU. They host A&M. They're at Vanderbilt. Then they host South Carolina. They're at Tennessee. They host Florida. And so when you look at some of these toss-up series, they're in Lexington. You know, you'd like to have that Georgia series in Lexington, but the teams that they're really competing with to move up in the pecking order, they're going to play many of those teams in the Commonwealth. So 
this will sound a little bit silly, I guess, but I'm going to take Georgia as my number six team in the East. And I think Kentucky could be anywhere from five to four, depending on how that South Carolina series goes. I think that's an important aspect of this. Again, how, how do you handle the series against the teams that are your contemporaries? And so maybe it's that I'm rooting for them. Maybe I'm rooting for Kentucky a little bit more because of uh, you know my, my, my feelings about Nick Mangione. I think there is a toughness in this Kentucky team that maybe there isn't in South Carolina and Georgia. And you know Georgia and Scott Strickland and those guys are always going to have good pitching. But there's just something about Georgia, and we've seen it, you know, a couple years ago they had the big fade at the end of the year. But it just Georgia, to me, doesn't exude toughness. Now looking at the Georgia schedule, they're going to host South Carolina. That's a big series. Then they'll, they'll travel to Auburn. They go to Vanderbilt. They host Kentucky. They go to Florida who's going to be really good this year. They host Arkansas, which I think is good. It's going to be a good team, too. They travel to Oxford. And that's, not, it, that's you know, you can say what you want to. It's a tough place to go play. It is. They host Tennessee. And then they round out the SEC play uh, going to Missouri and then hosting LSU. So the schedule in my – you're kind of comparing schedules. and None of them are easy. But I think I would rather have Kentucky's schedule. So we're going to run that Missouri. I've talked myself into this. Okay, Missouri 7, South Carolina 6, Georgia 5, Kentucky 4. I I just think this Kentucky team will play hard for Nick. I think there's enough pieces there to make this thing awfully interesting. I may look back a month from now and say, you know what, I completely blew this. But I think Kentucky is better than people realize. And again, you know, Nick Mangione is kind of the master of the short game. He knows how to you know, move runners and things like that. He will have those guys ready to play. I just think South Carolina is a little bit overvalued, and I worry about Georgia offensively. And then there's a the top three in the East. Vandy, Florida, Tennessee. Well, I think we can all agree Tennessee will probably win the East. And I think I agree with the coaches that Florida, because of Sully's ability to develop pitchers, will be better than Vanderbilt. So that's really the, 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 the only change that I have is moving Kentucky ahead of Georgia, South Carolina. I agree with the top three. I do think Vanderbilt obviously will have some talent, and they're very good in their own ballpark. They don't have the pitching they've had, though even though they have recruited well. They lost some guys off last year's team, of course, Carter Young. Uh, guy's got a big hole in his swing, but perhaps they can turn it around at LSU. But I do think Vanderbilt has kind of come back to the pack a little bit, a little bit. Vanderbilt can ill afford to drop a series to any of the teams behind them in, in the uh, preseason predictions. So, again, Missouri, South Carolina, Georgia, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, Florida, Tennessee. I may have given you the wrong order earlier. That's how I feel. Look at the West. I'm going to be honest with you. I think us being picked seventh is a good thing. The reason that I think it's a good thing is I think people are going to overlook us, even though we're Mississippi State. They shouldn't, but I think people will. I think people think, ah, you know, it's the same team as last year. Guys, we had no bullpen last year. None. We had to piecemeal the starting pitching together. And I think Kate Smith's going to have a big year this year because we're not going to have to stress him quite as hard. The guy's a competitor. He's always wanted to be a bulldog. I expect him to go out tonight and get a big win for us. I say big just because it's the next game. They got us picked seventh. Guys, I'm going to have Alabama seventh. I'm going to have Alabama seventh. And I'm going to keep Auburn six, and I'm going to bump Mississippi State up to five. I think we'll be no worse than fifth in the league this year. You say, but Steve, what everybody else says this. I, you know, I, I follow it pretty closely. I, I prefer I don't get out and go ride around and, and go see everybody else play in the fall. I just don't know if Alabama has the pitching depth to get it done. I think Butch Thompson 
at Auburn will find a way to find just enough pitching to finish just ahead of Alabama. And that's not to say that these are going to be bad baseball teams. I think the West is so incredibly competitive this year. I think really probably everybody outside of LSU, you could make a case for second with maybe the exception of Alabama. I just don't think Alabama has enough of the pieces left. And again, when you look at the schedule, they get an SEC play at Florida. They host Kentucky. They then go to Arkansas. Then they host Mississippi State. Then they host Auburn. They travel to Missouri. That should be a break for them. Then they go to LSU. They host Vanderbilt. They go to A&M. They host Ole Miss. Guys, that's a brutal schedule. And again, I, I think them finishing seventh is more of a byproduct of the quality of the league this year. I think Alabama could be better and still finish dead last in the West. They got to get fat during non conference, but that is a very brutal schedule when you look at SEC play. I mean, you know, your home series, you, know, you could say, are toss ups, but you got to go play in some of the most difficult venues in college baseball. That's tough. And I just don't know if Alabama has the pieces to get that done. Maybe you disagree. When I look at Auburn, you know, I, I know what to expect from Auburn pitching. It's very rare that they're going to put you know, guys out there on the mound that can't get out. So they're going to compete. They're going to be prepared. They're not going to try to do too much. But they're not going to blow you away either. They're not. I think we all know this. And so when I began to think about this conference schedule, and listen, I get this, this is crazy too. They're going to open up with Indiana. Next weekend, they travel to USC. You talk about testing your team early. That's getting it done. Well, they open up SEC play at Arkansas. We know how much fun that is. And they host Georgia. And I like Auburn in that series. That's, that's one of the factors in my decision about moving Georgia down. And then they're going to go to Florida. Auburn does. They host A&M. They travel to Alabama, then they host Mississippi State, they travel to South Carolina, they host LSU, they travel to Ole Miss, and then they wind up hosting Missouri. And I think that last weekend could be an important one when it comes to the standings. I think Auburn catches a break there. But I think Mississippi State finishes ahead of the Tigers. I don't know that Auburn has the offensive firepower that Mississippi State does. Then you've got Ole Miss there. Uh, fourth. Now, a lot of people are curious, you know, what what's the Ole Miss uh, team going to look like this year? Okay, Mike Bianco knows how to manage pitchers. I know he gets a lot of, you know, criticism from some of their fans. But Bianco has developed some good pitchers over the years. And I think a lot of that comes from his experience of being a catcher. Now, there are guys that have had some injuries, and that's, just, that's not an Ole Miss problem. That's a baseball problem. But – they're not going to be as good as they were last year. But let's, let's not forget, too, Ole Miss wasn't a great team until late. They had all kinds of problems with pitching. Then they, had, they, they kind of went in the tank at times uh, when it came to scoring and just simply couldn't get it done. But, uh, you know, Jacob Gonzalez is a star. And uh, this is a guy, too, that uh, can hit for power and can hit for average. But people forget Ole Miss finished 14-16 and 16 in the conference last year. Had a losing record in conference. And, uh, you know, you remember we went up to Oxford and won that series. And there were a lot of people back then that were like, hey, well, this is it. Bianco's getting canned. A- after that game, that Sunday game we won, Ole Miss was 22-17, and 17, five games above 500 on April 23rd. And then the next thing you know, they start piecing this thing together and they end up being the last team in the tournament and they win the NFL championship. And people are like, oh, they got a they got a peach of a of a of a regional, and they did. And some could argue too that they didn't deserve it. But when you look at the fact that they went to LSU and they swept LSU, if they drop any of those games, they don't make the tournament. But they do make the tournament, despite the fact that they lost two out of three to, to AM. They're one and done in a tournament. I think most people of us thought, well, that's it. They're done. They're done. But when you start looking around the country and comparing resumes, I don't know how you kept Ole Miss out. And they beat, they didn't pick their regional. They got sent to number six, Miami. And they swept the regional. 
Arizona obviously ran out of pitching in that thing. But, uh, you know, listen, it's not like Ole Miss was just had this paved path to a NAFL championship. They absolutely didn't. They absolutely didn't. And, and you tip the cap. You know, much as we don't like them, the reality of it is you got to respect the fact that they were five games above 500, got into the tournament, and then made the most of it. And listen, who knew Dylan DeLucia was going to be what he became? I mean, down the stretch, that guy was pitching as well as anybody in the country, and he's gone. But this is an Ole Miss team, obviously, that uh, has recruited well over the last couple of years. There's not going to be some big drop-off. But, uh, you know, you don't have Tim Elko. Um, you know, you got some other pieces out there, obviously. But um, Ole Miss is going to be in a tournament. I mean, you might as well get ready. I mean, are, do they host? I don't know. It kind of depends to be, you know, we'll see. But uh, they're going to be around. Sure. And look at SEC play for them. You know, they open up at Vandy. That's tough for both teams, right? Um, you'd almost wish Gonzalez was a right-hander hitting the net ballpark. Then they host Florida, and then they're at A&M. So pretty difficult three, three series open for Ole Miss. So you may see them dip, and then they get old Arkansas coming to Oxford. And then they come to Mississippi State, and then it's LSU. You talk about a difficult first half of the SEC schedule. That's it. Uh, then they host Georgia. They, they travel to Missouri, which should be a series win. And then they host Auburn. And they're at Alabama to close it out. And so you look down the stretch, you say, hey, the final four, once you get through LSU, those last four series for Ole Miss are winnable, you know, depending on health. And so, again, I think they're mid-level in the SEC. I got to pick them ahead of us right now just because I think that they're maybe a little more complete. They don't have quite as many questions as us. But I, I would put State and Ole Miss pretty much in the same boat. But right now, because of the fact that we've got a few more questions, I'd pick them. I'd pick them narrowly above us. And then I would have A&M. I know a lot of people have A&M kind of as a sexy pick this year uh, for Omaha, and they did, had a great year last year, put some big things together. And you say, well, Steve, that means you got Arkansas second. And that's true. But I think when you look at this A&M schedule, I think this is an important thing to factor in, too. It's not just the quality of the teams. It's when you play and who you play, right? That's an important aspect of all of this. And, again, health is a major factor, too. I mean, we've, how many times have we seen this where you see a team hot early on and then they have a, a big loss early? But um, the non-conference schedule for them is a joke. In many respects, they do go down to the Shriners Classic down there. They'll take on Louisville and Texas Tech down there. And I think we'll, we'll get a pretty good idea of what they have pitching-wise in that. But before that, I mean, it's Seattle, U, Lamar, and Portland. You know, it, it's just – it's not anything important. So, then they get Northern Kentucky. We know those guys, too. They open up SEC play, hosting number one LSU. That's a tough draw. And then they get Tennessee in Knoxville. And then you get Ole Miss. Then you're at Auburn. Then you host Mizzou, then you're at Kentucky, then you're at Arkansas, then you get Florida, Alabama, you travel to Mississippi State to close it out. You get a couple breaks in the schedule, but it's not great. And I think this is a team, too, that opens up probably in the hole in the SEC. I think after you get through the first three weekends, I think it's pretty safe to say they'll likely have a losing record in conference. And there are a lot of people that are picking them to beat a surprise team. I just don't see it playing out the way many do because of the schedule. Arkansas, a much different dynamic, if you ask me. You know my respect for the Arkansas baseball program. I think Dave Horn is an outstanding coach. I think they're going to be tough as long as he is there because of their ability to evaluate and develop players. I think that's an important aspect of every bit of this. Baseball is a developmental game. It really is, probably more so than uh, most sports. But when you begin to break down this Arkansas schedule, I think we'd all look at this and say, you know what? I think they're in pretty good shape. Non-conference, not really competitive other than Louisiana Tech. That's a a nice, solid mid-major. They open up with Auburn in Fayetteville. You got to feel like that's a series win. Then they go to LSU, which is a tough draw early. It's got you chasing the season, but then you bounce back weekend, you host Alabama. So you feel like after three weekends, you'll have a winning record. Then you travel to Ole Miss. That's a toss-up series. A Sunday game will likely decide that. You host Tennessee, and you know how dicey that thing has been? 
to get them in Fayetteville, that's huge. It's going to be some huge crowds. They then go to Georgia. Then you host A&M. Then you travel to Mississippi State. You host South Carolina. Then you close it out at Vanderbilt. I, I just like that schedule. If I'm picking between A&M and Arkansas, the schedule is just simply more favorable for Arkansas. Not to mention, you know, when you think about the Aggies, it's like if we're contemporaries and we're competing for that second spot, I'd love for that series to be at home. Well, it is for Arkansas. That's an important aspect of all this. Again, it's, it's, it's not just who you play. It's when you play them and where you play them. I like Arkansas' schedule. I think it sets up really well for them. And, again, they, they've, they've, they've lost some pieces. There's no doubt about that. They've, they're missing some pieces from they were a year ago. But I think, really, I think you could take anybody outside of LSU right now and shake us up and you wouldn't be able to tell a big difference, especially, I think, A&M, Ole Miss, Arkansas, Mississippi State. I put us in that second group. I think the Alabama teams will finish 6-7. and seven. I do. I think both of those teams are going to not have what it takes offensively. And then I think – I don't know if they've got the bullpen depth on either side – to continue to win a lot of pitching duels. I just – maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I feel about it. Uh, LSU non-conference schedule is uh, is not good. they got a couple of midweek games. Texas is in there and that sort of stuff. They'll get Samford there prior to SEC play. And we talked about it. If they open up at A&M, that's a tough draw for the Aggies. They then host Arkansas. They didn't travel – excuse me, they host Tennessee. And can you imagine Tennessee and that little softball field they have at LSU? That, that – you talk about – that may be home run derby right there. Then LSU's at South Carolina. That's a break in the schedule. LSU then hosts Kentucky. LSU should handle that. LSU then travels to Ole Miss. LSU then hosts Alabama. Then they're at Auburn. They host us. Then they travel to Georgia. So not only does LSU have probably uh, the best offensive roster, they may have the most favorable schedule in the SEC West with Arkansas kind of closely behind them and of course LSU host Arkansas so when you start breaking this stuff down you begin to realize you know it's so difficult to win on the road around here but also too when you have a home home field advantage like they have at LSU and many of your toss-up series are there it just it works good so so again I've got Alabama seventh Auburn sixth Mississippi State fifth Ole Miss fourth a and third, Arkansas second, LSU first. And I've got LSU winning the SEC this year. I don't want them to win it. And a lot of it's going to depend on health. Of course, they, they had a big uh, injury come up over the weekend or last week. But uh, I think the West is very, very balanced. I think that probably half of the teams in the East will make the tournament. And then we'll see how things go. But uh, I think it's, we're going to beat each other up on the West. We are. And anybody out there that can take a game from LSU is good. But uh, you also start thinking about, you know, what's the best interest for Mississippi State here, right? We're not going to win the West this year. Okay, so we're not chasing LSU. So we really need LSU and teams like Tennessee that are expected to compete for conference championships to beat up our contemporaries. We need them to kind of run interference for us. And so, you know, my rooting interest is always going to be against everybody else in the West, every other team in the standings that is similarly situated as us. We need those teams to lose. We need to win as many as we can, and we need the front runners in this league to beat up everybody around us to give us a little bit of cover. That's an important aspect of every bit of this you know, for Mississippi State. We need some help to run interference to ensure that we make Hoover and make the NCAA tournament field. we got to do our part, but the better that the, the lead teams in the league do, because we don't expect to contend – for a division or conference crown this year. We'd love to. We're just not at that point. We may surprise some people. But we need LSU and Tennessee to just beat up on Arkansas and Ole Miss and uh, give us a chance to move up in the standings. That's how I see it. Perhaps you disagree. But I do agree with the coaches that Tennessee and LSU should win the divisions and that LSU will be your SEC champions and likely one of the top seeds in a tournament, as they should be. But there is a reason they play the games. And uh, you may recall... In 2016, Mississippi State, coming off a dreadful 2015 season, John Cohen likely coaching for his job in 16. We won the Southeastern Conference that year. We won it outright by ourselves. 
That year, Florida was picked to win the league. I just happened to have that coach's preseason poll in front of me. Alabama was picked seventh, Auburn sixth, Ole Miss fifth, Mississippi State fourth, and the only reason we were fourth is one of the coaches voted us number one. May have been John Cohen. <laughs> Who knew? We had 49 points, Ole Miss had 46. Without that first place vote, we'd probably pick fifth. Arkansas was third, LSU was five, excuse me, second. A&M was picked to win it. They finished second. They did come in and sweep us that year, too, if you recall. In the East, it was Tennessee seventh, Georgia sixth, Missouri fifth, Kentucky fourth, South Carolina third, Vandy second, and Florida first. Mississippi State, not people expected much from us, and uh, we ended up not only winning the SEC, but being a top eight national seed for the first time. We did not have a single player selected preseason all SEC by the coaches that year. Not a single one. And I submit to you, there are more questions about that team than there are about this team. Because based on what happened in 15, we were an absolute mitigated, unmitigated disaster. The pieces that have been brought in, thanks to the transfer portal, kind of mean a, a quick turnaround. Now, you may recall, too, the 2016 team, we had Jack Kruger and Nathaniel Lowe that came in as junior college transfers. And a guy named Daniel Brown that was really an unheralded player to do some big innings for us, also a transfer in. And so a lot of similarities to the situation we're in. Can we get a similar result? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not expecting that, but I didn't expect that in 16 either. And that's the thing about the portal is you can get an influx of talent, turn things around very quickly. So I just remind you of that. Again, not picking state to win it. I've already given you my picks. But there's a reason we play the games. There's a reason we play the games. And that 16 team, you, you, just out of the blue, Dakota Hudson had thrown, I think, 12 SEC innings in his career. Ends up being an All-American. You know, so you always have people come out of nowhere. You know, Austin Sexton, of course, a real competitor for us. Great Saturday starter for us. And, uh, you know, Pilk, of course, uh, started some on, on Sundays after uh, – you know, Zach Evans was a little ineffective, and Zach came back late. I mean, you know, so we kind of pieced it together. Teams that can find a third starter and get production at the bottom third of their order win championships. Simple as that. And we did. We won a conference championship that year. So I'm going to write this article up, and uh, we're going to get on the road to Duty Noble Field and see if we can't take our first step uh, towards being Mississippi State again in college baseball. If you had not done so, go to dogpilethebook.com. You can order all my sports books there. It's Dogpile, Flim Flam, Stark Villains, and Alpha Dogs. Blooms of Oleander, available through Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksAmillion.com, or your local bookstore. Stark Villains gear always available at StarkVillains.com. Be sure and check us out today. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. This week at Macy's, find your new favorite jeans with 40% off Levi's looks for him and her just in time for spring. Or use your coupon or Macy's card and take an extra 15% off handbags and wallets already 40 to 50% off. And take an extra 10% off great furniture and mattress deals too. Plus, Star Rewards members earn rewards even faster during Macy's Star Money bonus days. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Community Insurance Company.